Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. The number of COVID-19 cases is about to touch 3 million and the number of deaths has crossed 130,000. Many states are seeing a fresh outbreak. There are some, some states which are not part of the huge outbreak earlier, but which are now seeing a large number of cases. And to talk more about this, we have with us Dr. Hani Sarag of the People's Health Movement, who's also with the University of Texas Medical Branch. Thank you so much, Dr. Hani, for talking to us. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, thank you for reaching out to me. Yes, to begin with, so we did see a huge spike in cases a couple of months ago, especially there was Washington State, there was New York, where the numbers were in thousands every day. And at least in some of those states, the number seems to have decreased. Whereas in other states, like for instance, right now, Texas is reporting a huge number, Arizona, California continues to do so. So could you talk about how the center has kind of shifted in the United States and which are the uh, epicenters, so to speak? Yeah, uh, there are two issues here when we're talking about uh, numbers. Um, one of them is numbers right now, and it's not only for the US, it's all over the world, are concerning the positive cases from those who are tested. So the more you have testing, the more you will find cases. And this applies to the US and applies uh, anywhere uh, uh, else. So when you increase the magnitude of testing, like what happened in New York after the surge, you find lots of cases. And this has been happening in different states. So when they scale up the testing, the number of cases started to rise significantly. But also, there is kind of a shift in the spread of COVID-19 in the US, slowly from the east and the far west to the south, somehow. So uh, right now, Texas, as you said correctly, Texas and Florida and Atlanta are on the rise uh, right now. And to a great extent, I would say, yes, the U.S. is having the, has the highest number of cases right now and the highest number of uh, uh, deaths. And unfortunately, this is not surprising to me because the most important here is to look at what determines the, what shapes the uh, uh, response to the pandemic. And here in, 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 in the US, it's basically the interest of corporates. So this is one of the major issues. So if you, if you compare between the response in Europe, for example, at least some of the European uh, uh, countries and the US, Europe had a complete lockdown. Right. I'm not saying that this is the solution everywhere in the world because some countries cannot afford it. But Europe afforded it and they could do it. And this resulted in significant reduction in cases in quite a, a, a short time. And a good example for that was Italy, was Spain, was Germany, France, and, and so on. And also they had very difficult measures that are somehow against the neoliberal notion. One of them, like what happened in Spain, is to put all private hospitals and facilities under the management of government. So in other words, you say, okay guys, we're not going to take the hospitals from you, from the private sector, but we're going to borrow it for a while. You will, unfortunately, stop profiting at least for a while. This didn't happen and will not happen in the U.S. in the very uh, uh, near future. Actually, the, the, the reverse, actually the opposite happened, that there is a huge push to open and the use the uh, politicians here are using the term of opening the economy as if the economy it has only one definition 
So this is the economy. This is all what we know, and we cannot think of any other way. So we need to open the restaurants, and we need to open the markets. We need to, to open even the bars and beaches and so on. And the idea here when the government, because I, I, I strongly believe that there is a culture in the U.S., that people, at least a majority, have lots of confidence in the administration. Even if they disagree on the general direction of administration still, when, when they say that it's time to open and let people go to work, let people go to restaurants and markets, this gives a message to the public that we are on top of it and we are in control, and everything is going fine, which is really a very wrong message. So even if they say people try to be cautious and wear masks, things like that, this doesn't happen. When they started, I'm, I'm talking about Texas, when they opened and people started to go to restaurants, the uh, uh, occupancy in the, in the restaurants were higher than needed, no masks inside, and in Galveston, near to where I'm, I'm living, people were in bars and places like that without any masks, without physical distancing, and so on. So we witnessed a huge rise during the last two weeks. Actually, the status here in Texas is not very good. Some hospitals um, in Houston specifically became overloaded and they started to transfer cases to other hospitals. So we hope that we will not see what happened in New York. We will not see what happened in Italy in the beginning. And uh, it's not too late to take strict measures, but we need to put people's health, people's lives before the profits. In the, in the last like 10 or 12 weeks, we, we had 40 million people in the US lost their jobs because of COVID-19, right. why? Two people made $63 billion added to their wealth. Only two people. The owner of Amazon and the owner of Facebook. So, again, not everybody is harmed by the pandemic. So, those people have no reason to lock everything down. And it's not only this, I mean, those people are benefiting from people go to streets or not because they, they, they work virtually, but this applies to corporates, all of them. It's not bad for them. And this is the same like when we talk about wars, when we talk about conflicts, it's not bad for everybody. There are people who are benefiting and making more money out of people's death and ill health and so on. So this is what's going on. So as a follow-up question, I would actually like to talk a bit about the, how the crisis has been addressed in the United States itself. So you're part of the public people's health movement and this movement across the world has been calling for a very different and radical way of addressing the crisis, a way in which uh, the crisis is not looked as a law and order problem. It's not looked as a purely scientific problem, but as a community health and a public health issue where the community is involved and it is a far more political way of looking at health. So has there been any signs of that being shown is in anywhere in the United States or that being talked about, that being discussed, etc.? Well, as I said, the main determinant of the response for COVID-19 was economic and political. So there was huge fear from uh, taking strict measures that this will affect the economy. So uh, this affected to great extent the messages that are being given to the public. So this also uh, uh, made uh, people more relaxed uh, while dealing with COVID-19. The, the sad story that uh, the US is able to take very strict measures 
because they can afford it simply. We can afford it here. So we're not talking about emerging economy or, you know, you're talking about very well-established economy that can afford something like that for at least for a while. But the idea is there, there was a tendency to distribute the associated cost with the pandemic. So we know there is associated cost with the pandemic. Who's going to pay it? Corporates, state, or people? So, and I think the administration here took a decision, no, we will not pay it fully, we will not let uh, uh, corporates pay it, we will distribute on people as much as possible, and this includes the lives, illnesses, and so on. And, and finally, so from a, a people's health perspective, what would be the essential steps that need to be taken? Of course, the United States is not a monolithic structure. There are many levels of government. But in terms of very basic steps right now, what would be some of the things you would suggest? Well, uh, there are, I think there are two, uh, uh, um, two big categories here. One, during the pandemic, we need kind of social solidarity. We need kind of unity. And we need uh, um, kind of leaderships from activists to, to promote the uh, uh, public health values before profits and struggle against these measures from governments to stop. We need to slow down the spread till we have a, a, a vaccine or a treatment. And here it comes the second stage. Hopefully we will have a vaccine or a vaccine, let's say uh, not, 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 not a treatment, not a completely curative uh, uh, treatment, but most likely we're gonna have a vaccine at some point, uh, uh, maybe uh, available uh, early next, next year. So who's gonna access? And this is a big, the very big question as, as, as well. So the, the member states of WHO refused um, a very legitimate suggestion from Costa Rica to have a public patent on uh, uh, any uh, uh, curative medicine or vaccines for COVID-19, and this was refused. So the refusal means, no, we're still putting it in the market uh, uh, place, and this is uh, uh, this is quite uh, uh, scary because we may find us in a situation that those who can afford paying for uh, uh, the vaccine will exit. And actually, this happened. This is happening right now when Gilead um, had their uh, 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 treatment. It's a price here, the, 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 the price per course here in the U.S. is $4,200. Uh, uh, and I know that it's not much cheaper in uh, other uh, countries. So this means that it will be affordable by the elites. And this is a treatment. If this applied to a vaccine, I hope that it will never happen uh, but still, I think it's not going to be an easy thing and it needs a lot of struggle, a lot of, a lot of unity, a lot of very high voice from uh, health activists to stop that. Uh, and also, it will need some measures from progressive governments, if there are, to use flexibilities of uh, uh, trips to have compulsory licenses, if this happened if they have the capacity to uh, produce it, because the, the, we have like five, com five companies in the whole world that they have capacity for mega mass production. So this means it's gonna be monopolized uh, 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 somehow. After COVID, I hope that things will not return back to where they are when people can be outside and can be together again, I think this needs activists, not, not only health activists, but in general, politically active uh, uh, people 
to continue struggling for different worlds. Absolutely. We, we, we knew the COVID-19 exposed it naked. So we know exactly what capitalism means, what neoliberalism means. It's very clear right now. And COVID-19 with all what we have right now, including the climate change, including the, 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 um, uh, the uh, natural disasters, the increase in, in magnitude and so on, this is not the last thing. So we need to prepare ourselves as people in this world to be able to deal with this differently and to put people's life, health and livelihoods and so on in front of uh, uh, profits. This is a long-term struggle, but I think it's, it's, um, it's needed more than ever right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Hani, for talking to us. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch. Bien cantar, que vamos a triunfar.